Jennifer Fairbanks and I am the owner and designer of Porcelain and I am here with my daughter. Um, she is going to interview me today as this is my very first podcast episode and I felt it would be nice to get to meet her since she's a big part of my life and my business and um, be interviewed by her. So thank you Emily for uh, spending this afternoon with me to film this. You need to speak, honey. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, so what is your first question for me? What was the first thing that you made? First thing that I made ever in my entire life? Yep. Oh, I think it was a little teddy bear that was calico that I hand sewed at my grandmother's house when I was probably about oh five or six and i think it's something that we may still have if i ha if it's not in your room it may be in the top of your closet okay um what was the first thing that you made like uh when you had your store oh when i had my store the first thing that i ever made um that's a tricky one so i opened up my store in san francisco after I'd already had a clothing line. So I already had a lot of stuff that I was making and selling in other stores. Um, so I don't really know specifically what I made the first thing for my shop, but I did do a lot of special pieces. So I would actually design something and um, put it in the store window to get some people's attention. And there were a few projects that I would do. Um, let's see, I worked with a couple artists. So we had some art exhibits in the space and when we had a specific artist i'd ask if they would want a design a clothing design to accompany it and so there was a couple of projects i did where i actually made a garment inspired by the pieces that were in the shop um what was it like to teach at fitum i really enjoyed teaching at fitum it was it was exciting to see other students eyes light up um, especially when they learn something new. That's one of the reasons I enjoy teaching today still is because when you're showing somebody how to do something brand new, there's a, a point when you see their learning switch from like, okay, I'm just following the steps to, oh my gosh, I totally understand this and I can completely relate and I can incorporate this into everything else I'm doing. Sometimes that's not very quick, but it was really cool seeing the seeing my students connect those dots in the classes I was teaching because I actually grew the most in my design by actually learning in school and when I actually had my teachers helping me connect those dots that's when I had my aha moments like I finally understand why everything works and so because I had that experience in school I loved seeing it when my students were able to have that experience in school. Um, why did you stop teaching at FIDM? So after you were born, I went back to teach for one semester. And as a mother and as a parent, as anyone can, who is a parent can understand is that you look at the world completely differently after you've had a kid. And so I, when I went back to school, you know, it was my students that always kind of their drive and their excitement in learning things is what drove me to continue teaching and wanting to teach and do design. Um, and after you were born, I started to see what I didn't see previously. It was always there, but the students, either the ones that didn't want to be there, I started noticing them a whole lot more than the students who wanted to be there. And it became really hard for me to go into work knowing that the kids didn't want to be there. And yes, I had some that still wanted to be there and still wanted to learn from me and pick my brain and get all the information that they could from me. But those one or two students that didn't want to be there affected my mood for everything. And being a mom, like I picked up on all of that and I didn't notice it before, but I know it was there. So after a semester going back, I took a leave of absence. And that's actually when I opened up my shop in Redlands. So I had opened up with the intention that I was going to start my own design school. And I did. I actually had my own design school for about four years out there. Um, and 
you know, so I didn't really stop teaching, but I stopped teaching at FITM. Um, I think it was, I was on my leave of absence for about a year and I finally told them that I wasn't coming back. I think they already knew that I wasn't coming back at that point, um, but it was about a year that I decided that I wasn't going to. How did you get to teach at FITM? <laughs> I was selling in a little store in San Francisco in Hayes Valley called RAG, which was Residence Apparel Gallery. Um, and I was in there. Um, I think I may have even been working part time, volunteering or doing something in there. But I was there all the time because it was a really great shop. I had a lot of friends that owned it, worked at that, worked at it. And um, there was always somebody cool hanging out there. Um, and when I was there, there was another another woman there that actually did T-shirt graphics. And her name's Kyle. And um, she's actually the one who introduced me to FITM. She's the one who introduced me and say, oh, I think you would really enjoy teaching over there, seeing that you love teaching out of your studio. And so she made the initial introduction. And I'm still friends with her today, to this day. Um, it was one of the, the best referrals that I could have had um, because it definitely helped spur where I went in my career. How did you start pattern making? Um, well, actually, the pattern making all started while I was in school. Um, before then, I had taught myself minimal pattern making by taking my clothes, laying them on top of fabric, cutting out the fabric, trying to see, trying to make clothes from my existing clothes. Of course, when I did that, nothing had seams like you'd put a T-shirt down and you would just have basically this, this single cutout of a front and a back. Um, so that was kind of my first take of pattern making. So I didn't understand the, how things were constructed at that point, but I knew that that was somewhat close to it. I taught myself how to do draping. And so I had actually saved up my money while I was in probably junior high and bought myself a dress form. And I knew how things draped. I kind of knew a body, you know, there was a body so I could put fabrics on it. And I didn't know the first thing about pattern making. So I would go to the remnant bins at, at cloth world and I would buy all sorts of different fabrics. And sometimes they were really, really small and I would just start putting them up on the dress form and, you know, let's say, okay, I didn't have enough fabric for the back. So I would piece it together with another piece. Um, and so I had basically this patchwork dress. You couldn't see what was going on because I had an overlay on top of it. So I didn't understand how seams worked and where seams needed to be. So I pieced them together, would sew them together, put them on the dress form. Hey, it fits the dress form. I have a three-dimensional shape now, but I still didn't quite understand how that connection worked with pattern making. So the first day of, um, well, really the first day of draping class when I was at um, the Fashion Institute in New York, um, we did our basic draping, um, which is essentially pattern making on the dress form. And that first class, those light bulbs went off and I was like, I understand now why things fit differently than they do when I was making my pieces, because I finally understood where the shapes are in the body, where things needed to be. So I really kind of fell in love with draping at that point. Um, and actually, they didn't even have you do a pattern drafting class until I think your second year. But I had transferred in from another school. So I had done all the prerequisites. I'd done all the science, the math, um, the English. All of those were done at another school. So I had, I could actually do these other electives in the evening or, you know, basically to make up the rest of my credit hours. And so I took pattern making in that first semester as well. Um, oh, it was so cool. Like, because I started taking the, the draping class and then I took the pattern drafting and we were doing the same things in both of the classes, approaching the same result, but with a very different beginning. And it all made sense to me at that point. And so that was really the beginning of my love for pattern making was that first day. And I don't even remember who was in that class. I know it was an evening class and I just loved it so much. Um, how did you uh, come to uh, California? So after I left New York, um, when I finished school, I was in New York for a little bit longer and I got the worst job in the entire world while I was there. And it was so bad that I swore I didn't want to do fashion design anymore. 
And so I was really upset. I, you know, stayed in New York a little bit longer. I waited tables. I just did some jobs here and there. And then I eventually decided to come back to Florida because what I really wanted to do was move to San Francisco. So before I had actually moved to New York, my dad had taken me to a trip to San Francisco and I had fallen in love with it, but I was already on my way to New York for school. So I knew that San Francisco was in my future. I just didn't know where. So when I left New York, I was pretty much broke. So I went, came back to Florida and got a job working for my parents and, um, kind of decided to go back to school and learn a little bit of graphic design and web design um, and just help them out with their business. Give myself a little bit of time to save up money again before I could actually really go back and, and go to San Francisco if that's what I really wanted to do. How did you come up with starting a shop? Um, oh, that's a fun story. So I had gone downtown um, with some friends to an art opening over at another friend's shop. And I got into a conversation with somebody I hadn't really talked before, but I already knew she was in the community. And she was like, oh, yeah, I just opened up a place over on 14th Street. Isn't it funny? We live on 14th Street now. Mm -hmm. um, but on 14th Street in the Mission District. And she's like, there's a place that is available right next to me. You should totally open up a store. And over the course of probably a couple glasses of wine and over the night, the next morning, I was signing a lease for the space next door to her. <laughs> so I didn't know what I was doing. It was really, I had no furniture for a store or anything. Um, the selling point was, is that I could live in the back of it. So there was, um, there was really kind of almost three rooms in it. So there was a whole front retail store. Um, and then there was kind of in two little areas in the back and one area I used as my bedroom. Um, so it gave me a place to actually live. So I didn't have to worry about paying rent as well as having a storefront. And I, I'm trying to even think how big the space was altogether. I mean, it had to have been maybe 500 square feet. Um, I felt like it was a thousand square feet because I had never had a store before and it was all mine. It was one big open space and it just felt giant. Um, but I don't even think you could find a 500 square foot apartment for what I was paying for that. I think I paid was paying 1700 a month, which now is unheard of. That store is probably renting for, you know, $10,000 a month now. Um, you know, it needed a whole lot of work, um, but it was a lot of, a lot of fun, you know, living there in the store. I would actually have people over after hours. People would come over to shop and I'd be delivering wine to everybody but nobody drove in San Francisco. So people could come over and hang out for hours and we didn't have to worry about anyone getting behind the wheel of a car and driving home because everybody either took public transportation or, or some something, or they walked everywhere. Why did he close the, sh uh, the store? Um, I had the store for two years um, and it was, at least that I enjoyed it all the whole time. And we actually, I closed my shop in January of 2008. And if you guys remember 2008, towards the end, it was when we had our crash. So I had gotten burned out. Like I has, I was working all the time. The store was doing really well, but I was just exhausted. I couldn't do it anymore and I needed a break. Um, so I found a little studio apartment, not really studio, actually it was a loft over in Oakland um that my friend had moved into so she it was an upstairs unit that she, that was there and so I moved in there and I basically took and turned into a design showroom and then I kind of made a little corner with the bedroom um but it was one big giant space and that one was pretty amazing what did you sell in your store I sold clothes that I made I sold clothes that other local designers made so like it was really cool being in that community because I never had to buy clothes for myself because we traded. Um, and that was one of the biggest things is you barter and trade for everything. So all my handbags were designer from other people and they got clothes that I made and I would trade for clothes that they made or um, I got tons of jewelry. I mean, you've seen my jewelry collection, right? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so I always had tons of stuff. So I miss that type of thing in the community is being able to just trade for other people's stuff. <clears throat> How about let me ask you some questions now. 
So you have now had the opportunity to see what I do and take classes with me. And now you're in my after school fashion design program. What do you love most about what I do? Well, I really like the sewing and like making your own pattern. I also like how you get to be creative about like what you make and just it, like it be your own design. And so I'm guessing that's what you're enjoying doing for yourself, right? So I'm so glad that you're, you like doing what I like doing because it makes it a lot more fun. Um, you did a really good job yesterday with making that pattern. So it was really fun. So of the things that you've made, what is your favorite thing? I really like the shirt that I'm wearing and also um, show in front of the screen. So she made, she actually designed this shirt with little puff sleeves and everything. And she made this during the summer at our summer camp. Um, so what else, what else? Um, I also really like the tablet cover that I made. Yep. And you also made a stuffed cat. Oh Yes. She made a stuffed animal and she actually drafted her own pattern for her stuffed animal. Um, it's a warrior cat. Um, what oh, else? Please. What else have you been doing? You've been cranking stuff out. Oh, you made a whole bunch of coffee sleeves yesterday. Um, I have a couple uh, cats. You're my little entrepreneur. So, so what do you want to do in the future? Um, do you want to keep doing what you're doing? I do want to do it, but also I'm planning to probably be a writer also, because I really enjoyed doing that. Um, but I probably will, no matter what, probably end up making clothes for myself and stuffed animals. Um, but you do remember that I've written books too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I think you forget. I know. I'm talking about like fantasy, because that's kind of what I write best. So do you enjoy working with me, like doing the packaging and stuff for the business? Yes, because you get to do it in front of TV. <laughs> Most of the time we just put the TV on in the background to listen while we're doing some packaging. What else would you like to know about me? Um, how did you know that you wanted to uh, do pattern design and uh, fashion design? Oh, I... I think I always wanted to do it, but I didn't know what it was called. So I used to, when I was probably your age, because I think I was in sixth or seventh grade, I used to make clothes and either made them for my friends or actually sold them to my friends. Um, and I did that in high school and it was always something I enjoyed doing, you know, making things for myself or making things for others. Um, you know, it's something that I know we've ingrained in you to when there's a birthday party, you make something for them. And I used to do the same thing. I used to make a lot of things for people. Uh, it makes it for a lot more interesting gifts that are more unique. When I was, I think, 15, I went on a field trip with a family friend who um, he was actually an art teacher up in um, D.C. or up in um, up in Maryland. And he had a, a class field trip that was going up to New York City, and I had never been to New York City. And he asked if I wanted to go. And they were all kids that were my age. All kids were like 15, 16 years old and all artists. It was really cool. Um, and so I went up there. We, went, we took a bus up into Manhattan, and it was my first time ever going into New York, and it snowed. It started flurrying as we drove, you know through the tunnel, we came out of the tunnel, it was just flurrying. I was like, this is the coolest thing. And when we were there, um, I kind of befriended a couple, a couple kids and we kind of split off on our own and explored a lot of, oh, I think it had to have been the East Village. Um, it may not have been, I thought, I thought it was the East Village. And we wandered about into some of these little shops. Um, and so this was, you know, 90, like mid, I guess early nineties. Um, and we ended up in Betsy Johnson's shop and it was just, it was just so cool to see all of these clothes that were just so unique. And I think at that point, that's when I realized that there was actually something called fashion design. Um, 
you know, because I had never been around it. We grew up here in Florida, you know, we wore a uniform to school. So I didn't actually have a whole lot of experience with fashion. Um, I knew I enjoyed making things to, you know, for dress up days. So I would always wear something really unique for those. And half the time I made them. Um, but I think it wasn't until that trip that I realized that there was something called fashion design. And at that point, I knew that I was going to go into to design. Um, up until that point, I loved writing. I actually thought I was going to be a journalist. Like I used to write for my school paper because I loved writing. You know, I loved writing fiction. I loved writing fact. I loved just writing, just the act of getting your thoughts and stuff down on paper. And, you know, so when I decided to go to fashion school, everyone was really surprised. They're like, we thought you were going to go to school for journalism. I was like, no, I was like, this is where I, what I really want to do. And it wasn't until like, what, 10, 15, 10 years later, 15 years later that I actually wrote my first book in fashion design. And I was, and I didn't even click at that point that I just bridged my two passions that I had always wanted to be a writer, but I always wanted to be a fashion designer. And I always thought it was either you do this or you do this. I never really understood that you could do this. You could do writing about fashion design. You could write about what you're passionate about. And uh, it was just so exciting, you know, you know, being able to do exactly what I, what I've always wanted to do. So, um, so I know it's a long answer, but you know, I think, you really know it in your gut when it's something that you want to do. And sometimes you don't realize, realize it until you're much older that, Hey, Oh yeah, I wanted to do that when I was that old, but I didn't really understand that that's what it was I was wanting to do. So you have the world of possibilities in front of you with your aunt being a jewelry designer and your dad being in basically an engineer. Um, you have every type of possibility, you know, anyone that you can mentor and, you know. Uh, how did you come up with porcelain? The name porcelain I came up with when I was living in New York City. Um, I was actually, I was at work and I had this really light pink shirt on that was probably the color of your shirt. And I was really, really pale, like the color of your skin here. But I, my face was not as dark as yours is. And I was pretty much the same color as my shirt. And I showed up to work in this shirt. It was my favorite shirt at the time. And someone said, you look like a porcelain doll. And I was like, porcelain, huh? I really like that. That's kind of cool. So I kind of like stuck that in the, on the back burner. I was like, okay, I really like the name porcelain. And it wasn't until... I was back in Florida and I was working for my parents and the name of the company was called Matthews Benefit Group. And so my last name, my maiden name was Matthews. It was Jennifer Matthews. And I didn't have a lead position in their work. So I didn't want people thinking that, first of all, that I'm the kid of the owner. And I also didn't want people making assumptions that I either, you know, that I basically got the job because of my parents, which I did. But I also didn't want anyone thinking that I basically ran the business. So I stopped using my last name, Matthews, and I started going by Jennifer Lynn, which is my first and middle name. And so while I was back here working with my parents, I went by Jennifer Lynn, spelled L-Y-N-N-E. Um, and at that point, when I was coming up with the name Porcelain, you know, first it was just the regular spelling of porcelain because I was like, okay, yes, I look like a porcelain doll, you know. And then because I had stopped using my last name, I started playing around and I was like, wait, I can use my middle name in the spelling of porcelain and make it porcelain like me. And it just, there was no turning back. Like at that point, I knew it. Um, I reached out to a friend of mine who is doing graphic design in New York. And he came up with a logo for me and it's still floating around somewhere. You can still see it. And it's actually a porcelain face, which makes up the P of porcelain. Um, it was a really beautiful logo. And I used that for a very long time. I actually use that on the clothing labels. Now I just use the name porcelain and just a simple font. 
Um, but the original logo actually has um, a porcelain face for the P. So it's pretty cool. How did you start porcelain here in Florida? Well, I didn't really have to start porcelain here because I was still running the business. So it was, I already had the business online. So it was actually easy enough to just have it completely online. And so we worked out of my sewing studio and actually the little room that's supposed to be your sewing room right, right now is being used as storage. So there really wasn't a whole lot I had to do once we got here. Just a matter of just keeping the business going. Um, how did you move all the supplies from California to Florida? A really big moving truck. We hired a, a company to basically drive a trailer out that we filled up. So we filled up all my inventory in there. We filled up most of our house stuff in it. Um, and because we were in the mountains, the truck couldn't make its way up to the house. So we actually had to take all of our furniture from the house in the mountains down to Redlands and loaded up in the truck there. So then the truck came out with all, everything from the store as well as for our house. So it had a lot of stuff in it. So it was a lot of moving. It was a very, very difficult move moving from the mountains to Florida. At what point in time did you have to like uh, find a better place because it just like was too much with like the supplies? Um. Oh, for here? Well, we were here working out of the house for a little while. And during COVID, we acquired the contents from a Fredericks of Hollywood factory. And because that required more than a 150 square foot room or a, it's not 150, that's a 50, 15 square foot room. Um, we needed to get a much bigger space. We moved into a 1200 square foot warehouse. Um, you know, it was huge for us at the time. So we moved everything over there. And we kind of outgrew that last year. You know, there was uh, circumstances that needed us to move. And we found another place that was closer to us and that we could actually open up a sewing studio as well. So kind of taking my whole plan of what I had wanted to do out in California and bringing that here, that was, that was actually probably the, the best part is opening up the sewing school again. And it's not even been open up a year and it's been really great. Um, and that's kind of where we're at now. So you wouldn't be able to be taking classes with me had I not done that. So are you glad that I opened up the sewing studio? Yes. <laughs> um, how did you come up with the projects for the sewing classes? Oh, those are too hard. That's that's that answer is too hard. <laughs> I never know what to teach in the classes. It is one of the hardest things I have to do is once I got that introduction class figured out, okay, we've got three classes. This is what we do first week, second week, third week. Trying to do all the other projects, trying to figure out other projects has been really, really difficult because we pick a project and then we don't have people signing up for it or we don't have enough people signing up for it. So we've really just been sticking with our intro classes. We are hoping to add some fashion design courses in the springtime rather winter after the new year, we're planning to launch a fashion design program so other people can come and learn what you've been learning. Um, how did you come up with the retreats? The retreats? Well, I actually took a shoe making class in Oregon um, two years ago. Two years ago? I don't even remember when it was. A year and a half ago, maybe? Um, and it was a really, really great experience. And I'm like, and it was expensive and I happily paid it because I was going to learn from a master. I was going to learn something that I had never done before. And I was just so excited to like be around that, the knowledge that I knew this person had, and that I had at my fingertips, I could ask him any questions I wanted. And I was like, you know what? I'm like, I have that same type of expertise in the lingerie industry regard to bra making and really sewing in, in all in all sides of lingerie. And I was like, I think people would come to a retreat to actually come and learn from me and other teachers. I was like, it's it's a lot of work for having one person teach for an entire week. And I saw that. I saw that with the teacher that we worked with. There were only two of us. So it was me and my friend Misty went and worked with this shoe instructor. And 
it was a great experience, but I saw how exhausted he was. I saw how exhausted we were. And I felt that it would actually be easier for me if I had somebody else who was there also teaching. And so the original idea was, is that Lily, because I reached out to Lily first, is that Lily and I would actually teach the entire thing together. You know, we would start with one pattern, we would work off of each other, we would kind of teamwork as the class. And as we were talking about it, we're like, yeah, this is really great. Like we do have our own little following, but we didn't quite really know how to reach people. And that's when I suggested we added Maddie. Maddie is awesome. She's She's got a great reach. She knows a whole lot of people. And she is just, in general, she's got a lot of energy. And I love that about her. And so we invited her to be our third teacher. So we had three of us teaching the retreat this last spring. And it went off really well. I'm really happy with how it turned out. So as soon as we finished with that retreat, um, I started planning. I'm like, okay, so this was our proof of concept that we can get people to come out. We can have a really good week of learning and camaraderie and just being around other like-minded people. We decided that I wanted to try it again. So uh, immediately started planning for spring of next year. And we also started planning to do one in the fall. So the first thing was to figure out what teachers were going to teach at which retreat. And since Lily and I were the ones who really kind of started with this idea, and me ultimately, I'm the one who who had this idea that I wanted to do this. I brought Lily in. So Lily is also going to be a part of our spring retreat and our fall retreat next year. Um, but I wanted to mix up the teachers a little bit. So um, Maddie wanted to do the retreat in the fall. And so I felt, okay, that's a really good mix. We'll have her in the fall. I think we should also bring another teacher in for the fall, but I'd like to bring possibly two teachers in for the spring. So for the spring, we're bringing in Cassie Castillo from Primrose Dawn. Um, you know, I've always seen her work, but I've never really kind of met her. And um, it's been really great getting to know her between doing these interviews and just learning her history. Like she's got such an amazing background. And then also Lisha Sanders, which I had actually never, I didn't even know of her business, honestly, at this point. Um, Lily introduced us and it was like immediately, like we were best friends immediately. Um, and she is the owner of, co-owner of Stitch Love Studio. Um, so she's also a designer. Um, so we asked Lisha to also be a teacher. So it's going to be the four of us in the spring over five days. And then for next fall, we've asked uh, Bodil from Beware out in Sweden to join us as well. So um, I'm really excited. We have a whole bunch of new teachers that we're going to be working with this year. So we've also started planning our retreats for 2026. I'm not quite sharing all that information yet because we need to get through our retreats for 2025. So as soon as we have all of our spaces sold, for our spring and our fall retreat of 2025, we will make the announcement of our 2026 and begin registration. And we actually have some two really cool destinations um, that I can't wait to share with you, but I'm holding and biting my tongue because um, we can't do that yet. So I haven't planned my instructors yet. Um, so I'm super excited about the ones from next year first, and then we'll work on planning the next one. And what are you looking forward to doing at our Scotland retreat next year? Um, I'm really looking forward to doing uh, the shoemaking and like the other activities. And so I'm really ex I'm looking forward to actually see Scotland because I've never been. Well, hopefully you will enjoy doing some of the sewing projects too, because I think it'll be fun for you to be involved in the retreat and not just be there for the extra little shoemaking class we're doing or the um, excursions of Scotland. But I want to thank Emily for interviewing me today. Um, hopefully you guys have had a chance to learn a little bit about me. And I am looking forward to doing more of these. Um, stay tuned. We are planning to have these come out about every two weeks. And we're beginning with interviews. 
with all of the instructors who are going to be at our retreats. So until next time, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.